right, a couple things. First of all, I will only be in lab until noon today. So if you have questions, um, try to address them, um, you know, uh, quickly. Um, I apologize for that. Something came up. Um, what we're going to do today is essentially what we did last time, except on a details view. All right. So we did a, uh, a grid view last time, and we added the ability to delete and, and update. The one other thing we're going to do, by the way, is we're going to put a confirm in. I, I forgot about that. So we'll go and we'll put the confirm in to confirm deletion. Uh, but essentially, we're going to do the same thing except on a details view. And it's not going to be radically different. All right? It will largely be review because, again, you know, in object-oriented terms, a details view and a, a grid view come from a common ancestor, so a lot of their behaviors and properties are the same. So, therefore, it's not really too tough to, to make the leap and adapt it. But we are going to notice something else. And um, we're going to notice, for example, that um, if there's a foreign key relationship, um, we're not going to want to put the key in of the related row. We're going to want to select it based on some logical description. So we'll have to put a drop down, and that's where the fun's going to start. All right. Um, let's see what page we were working on last time. I think it was called Department. Remember, there are there's two pieces to 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 this because there's the data bit, and then there is the uh, visual part. So when we want to enable editing, we have to make changes in both places. We have to change this, the, the the data source to know what it means to do an update and, and how you get updated. We then have to change the GUI to say, yeah, updates are allowable. All right. As far as the data source goes, we make the, the updates happen by putting in an update statement. And so here, update, we have update department, set department name equals question mark, where department ID equals question mark. So if you think about it, you know, that's a generic um, update statement that we're going to execute, right? As a rule, you don't want to update primary keys. I'm not saying that you can't, but generally speaking, it's a good idea if primary keys aren't updated. Uh, that's another good argument for making it a surrogate key. You know, if you use someone's email address, let's say, as a primary key, their email could change. And again, it's not like it's... You know, it's to be avoided. So, update department, set department name equals question mark, where department ID equals question mark. We need the where clause in there so that it only gets the one that we want to change. All right. And what are we going to update? We're going to update the department name. So that's the SQL bit. Questions about that part? As far as the grid view goes... We simply choose the Enable Editing option on it. All right. When we do that, we get all sorts of default behaviors. All right. And we'll look at this because we really didn't code much of anything. About the only thing we coded, I think, is we coded some error trapping. But we might not have even coded that for an update. I'll have to look and see. Uh, we may have just coded the, um, on, uh, the, the delete um, air trapping. All right. But I didn't code anything. And yet when I go and bring this up, 
a lot of default behavior happens that, again, without really me having coded anything. So if we go here, we click edit. All right, right now we have edit and delete. I can go in and click edit. This right now starts out as a label. I can't type anything in there. When I click edit to put this in edit mode, it turns into a text box. And I can go in then and type something in here. And the buttons change to update and cancel. Update will make that change real. We'll actually update the database. Cancel backs out of it. So edit. If I click update, it actually goes and makes that change. Let's see if I did any error trapping. All right. No, I didn't. All right, so I didn't even code that yet. All right. So really all I did was I made the update statement and then told the grid view that it was able to be updated. When I did that then, I got all that behavior essentially for free. All right. Now, there's some, some bad things here. All right. Some, some bad things here. In fact, let's continue on this example for a, for a minute because I can talk about some of the things I want to do with this example before we even get into the details view. Um, the bad things are that if we get an error, then I don't want to um, get that big old ugly error. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing I did for the delete. I'm going to do uh, for the update. So I'm going to go in the code behind and. I'm going to copy this because this does what we want it to do. It just does it for the wrong event. And I'm going to make an updated. All right. I then have to tie this event to that control and when that control is updated. So, I'll go and do that by saying Wait, you kept it in the same code behind file, but it's just in a different section called updating. Yeah, everything, there's only one code behind file per page. So yeah, this is just an additional function on the same uh, code behind file. So yeah, here we go. I had on, on deleted. I have to tie this to that control and say on updated. Um, SQL data source. Updated. All right. So now when I go and run this. <coughs> If I go and edit this and update it, I get the message. Oh, it says deletion. It should say update successful. I forgot to change it. If I go to edit this, though, and I eliminate the department name, it tells me, well, again, it's giving me the wrong message. I forgot to change the messages, but we can go back and, and hit that. So now let's go back and do that. So if I go and try to save it with no name, and again, remember, it's a required field in the database, so that's going to throw a database error. Um, because it doesn't make sense to have a department without a name, we establish that constraint in the database. 
all right? And that way it will get enforced everywhere. I go to update it, it tells me the update failed. If I go and update it and I, I update it to something else, it tells me that that update succeeded. Yeah. I guess if you tried to call it marketing, that would cause an error because it would say there's already. Yeah. Because yeah. Well, if, if I don't remember what constraints I built into this, but if I build a unique cons, uh, constraint on that, it would give me an error. Let's see. All right. I must not have put that constraint in there. Yeah, go ahead. Um, will you be going over an example where you could maybe change more than one field? Yeah. Because I can't, I, I don't know what the query structure is supposed to look like. I mean, do you just keep using question mark or do those... On oh, the, the, query, the update I, statement? I'm sorry, on the SQL yeah. update statement? Yeah, if there's more than one field that you're updating, it just looks like that. Let's say, let's say there was a supervisor name in the department table or something. You'd say update department. There's one set. Then you'd say department name. equals question mark, comma, department email, let's say, equals question mark, comma, department office, equals question mark, no comma after the last one, and then you'd have your work clause where department ID equals question mark. So there's only one set. And there's only, uh, there's a comma then, and then the pair of field name, value, field name, value, field name, value. When we go over um, with the details view, we'll be updating more than one field. So we'll see an example of this um, running. Um, and keep in mind that, that pretty much what I do on a details view, I can do on a grid view and vice versa. The one exception, of course, is that I can't insert on a details view. I'm sorry, I cannot insert on a grid view. So again, that's the reason, by the way, getting back for this, that's the reason that I would... Um, put the constraint in the database, right? Because you might think, well, gee, I'm going to have to write all kinds of code now to check to make sure that there's no duplicate um, department names. And no, that's not the case. We want to build that constraint into the database. So we would go back into the database, open it up, and build that constraint in there. That way, that way any page, any program that hit that table and tried to update it, would not be able to update it and give duplicate names. So let's go in the design view for this. And I will make on department name, I will make an index. And I will not allow duplicates. Oops. Yeah, go ahead. If you have... Um like I have an example in my database where I have three fields that need to, three of them together need to be unique. How, how do you set that up in Access? Let me click Cancel. What you do essentially is when you create the index, you'd give an index name here, you'd pick the first field, and then the second field, and not give it an index name in the second field or third field. So if there's a third field, you'd pick that. So if there's no index name listed there, it considers it to be part of the index above. Will you use database tools here? Well, you go into indexes, yeah. back out 
uh, and I will not save it. And I'll go back in. And I'll put the constraint on this. So now I'll put in that this is index, no duplicates allowed. So now when I go and run this, if I try to give a duplicate name and go to update it, it tells me that the update failed. I could then possibly put, I mean, my error message there is not very descriptive. I could then possibly put um, some possible causes. One thing to remember with databases is databases add a, a giant amount of volatility to the process, right? Because you're at the mercy of something outside of your program. So in other words, the database could crash. All right, right in the middle of you trying to do an update. That's out of your control. Someone could have changed permissions on one of the tables and not allow the website to access them. Someone could change the column name. Someone could, could have it locked because they're doing maintenance. The point is, is there's a lot of things that can happen when you have database interactivity that you as a programmer have no control over. Therefore, you're not going to know all of the possible reasons for an error. But you can sure guess at some of the common ones, right? You know, for example, that the department name is required. You know, for example, that the department name has to be unique. All right? So you could put constraint, or you could put in your error message something like likely causes and then list them. All right? And again, you don't want to imply that those are the only causes because of the unpredictability associated with databases, but you certainly can tip off your user about what you think is likely. Now, in general, when you talk about errors, there's a couple ways that you can handle them. All right? One way to handle them, and again, right now our focus is on when constraints in the database go wrong. All right? So in other words, if I try to enter a um, department that doesn't have a department name, or if I try to enter a department that has a duplicate department name, those, because there's constraints built into the database, no matter what program I, I use to try to do that, it's going to get an error. All right? You have a couple strategies for handling errors, and depending on the circumstances, you may take any of these strategies. All right? One strategy that you can take is through your form design, don't let people put in something that is wrong. All right? So, for example, when we look at employees, we're not going to let the person enter in a department name or enter in a department ID. We're going to allow them to um, go ahead and, and choose it from a list. Right? And in that way, they can't possibly get it wrong. Right? Because they can only choose the departments that are legal and in the database. So that's one strategy. Through our form design, we keep them from doing something that's, that, that's wrong. Second possibility is that we validate. All right? Gee, we've gone in and created validations to make sure that a field is entered. Right? So I, could, I, I would think I would be able to put a validation control on the detail or on the department name and have that give me a nice user-friendly error message that says, hey, you can't save this. You know, you, you didn't put in a department name. And you can get that error, all right, you can get that error before it goes back to the server. So that's a good thing, all right? But there's no such thing as a duplicate validation control, right? So... I, I would have to do a little work to do validation to make sure that there was no duplicates. So you know what? I'm going to let the database give me an error if I try to put duplicates in, and I'm just going to handle it. So our three choices of handling errors, one of them is to design the form so that they can't make certain kinds of errors. All right? That's a powerful technique, you know. 
A second one is to put validation in our code. So they might be able to put in data that's wrong, but before we even try to save it, we'll validate it and we'll make sure that is correct. The last one is, it's too tough, it's impossible, I don't know, you could fill in the blank however you want to, to do a validation for it. So therefore, we're going to just let the SQL statement try to execute, let it fail, and just be there with a broom to clean up the mess. All right. Now, we're going to do number two and number three in this example. All right. Number two is something that we can easily validate. I can put a validation control on this page to make sure that they put in a department name. All right, we know how to do that. We know mostly how to do that. We don't know how to do it with a data grid, or a grid view rather, but we, we've seen required field validators before, so we're going to do that. The duplicate department name, we're just going to let it crash and burn, but we're going to be there with our dustpan to sweep up and give a nice user-friendly error. So that's what we're going to do now. Now, here's where we get into default behavior of grid views and details views versus what, how we want it to behave. All right? The default behavior of this detail, of this grid view, is when I go into edit mode, it changes anything that I'm allowed to change from a label to a text box. All right, so I click edit, changes it from a label to a text box. But there is no validation associated with that text box. So there's nothing that says, hey, that's required. Let me rephrase that. There's nothing in the default behavior that forces us to enter something in here that, that requires data to be entered in here. So therefore, if we want to put a validation control in here, we have to sort of uh, go off-road with it. We have to go, uh, we, we have to, uh, go beyond what the default does, and we're going to have to do some work to do that. Now, with grid views and details views, for the most part, when we want to go and do more, beyond the default behavior of the grid view or details view, that involves the use of what's called a template field. All right? So when you see template field, or if you think, gee, I don't want this to be a text box. I want it to be a drop-down. That's changing the default behavior. That means you're going to use a template field. If you say, hey, there's no validation on this text box, I want to validate to make sure that a number is put in here, or that something is put in here, there's a required field, or that it's a number between 1 and 100, all right, or whatever our constraint is that we want to validate. Since it doesn't do that by default, we have to go beyond the default, and going beyond the default involves creating a template field. So let's look to see how we can create a template field here to allow there to be a validation control, to make sure that there's something put in that text box. So, I'm going to go to the page, and I'm going to edit the grid view. And for department name, I'm going to click convert this field into a template column. convert this field into a template column. So I then go and click OK. Oops, click that first. Click OK. Now it's a template column. Well, what does that mean, this is a template column? It means that we can now edit how it's going to look and how it's going to behave. So notice I can click Edit Templates and all our template columns will appear. All right. Associated with each template column 
are four separate, or well, I'm counting wrong, five it looks like, separate templates. This is how it's going to look in different modes, and this is how it's going to behave in different modes. For example, the item template is what's going to display when the grid view is in read-only mode. And how is it going to display? It's going to be a label. That's what we've seen all along, right? That if we're in read-only mode, then it's a label. Alternating item template, we don't have one. In other words, we don't have, like, the green bar going across on alternating ones. The one that we're interested in is the edit item template. Because the item item, edit item template is where we have our little text box that we're going to allow the user to edit the item. This is the text box that I want to put a validation control on. Now here's what's funny about this, right? That text box isn't always on the page, right? That text box is only there when we're in edit mode. Therefore, I can't create the uh, required field validator the exact same way that I do it for other text boxes like we've done previously in class. But what I can do is I can go and I can drag a required field validator right onto this template field. So right on the edit item template. I'll put it right there. And I can go in here and I can set the properties of it. Give my error message. All right, format it however I want to. And the one thing I have to do is I have to associate that required field with the text box. That's part of the template. So watch what happens. Now if I go in and view this. If I go to edit mode and I try to save it with nothing in there, I get my error message. Must have a department name. All right. Notice that it didn't give me that error saying that the update failed. Why? Because it didn't even try to do the update first. Right? This is done client-side validation. All right. So therefore, this is sort of a win-win situation. In other words, if there's no department name there, I know that that update is going to fail, right? Because I know that, up, that, that department name is a required field. So therefore, it makes sense to catch that error on the client side, so I'm not going and trying to do an update that I know isn't going to work anyhow. So notice we don't even try to do the update. So we've actually prevented the problem from happening, all right? The person could put in invalid data. They can empty out that field. So we let them try something that isn't right, but we catch it before there's any errors. We catch it before there's any damage done. All right. And now we can go in and we can fill it in. And if we fill it in, then we can go and do the update. And the update is successful. All right. Question. Wait, was it only catching? Oh, okay, never mind. Do you want to go ahead and ask that question anyhow, even though you know the answer? Oh, I mean, it was just going so fast, and I was just okay. writing stuff, but it's, it was just a required field validator. It's just a required field validator. To make sure there's something there. Right, to make sure there's something there. Which means, what? If I go in and put in a duplicate, will that validator catch it? No. Why doesn't it catch it? Well, that's not what required uh, field validators do, right? They only make sure that you put something in that field, all right? 